Thank you, Kim, for that lovely introduction. And I cannot express how excited I am he here today to talk about my graduate work, which I absolutely loved. Um, when I first started as a graduate student at Baylor, I was interested in trying to understand something about the brain and what happens to the nervous system when we develop neurodegenerative diseases. And once I started, I quickly realized it was a lot more complicated than I really ever imagined. In any neurodegenerative disease where there's a loss of neuron that leads to a physical or mental deficit, there's many things that occur at the same time. So generally, you will find signs of aberrant synaptic dysfunction or oxidative stress or mitochondrial dysfunction. And these things are generally happen at the same time. You'll find all of these hallmarks at different stages and different regions of the brain. Since model organisms for studying neurodegeneration have been focused on late stage models that already have degeneration, the problems are, well, there's three major ones. We don't really know the primary cause and trigger that first start the cascade for neurodegeneration. And because of that, the molecular and cellular mechanisms are ill-defined. And finally, the synergism of how these insults interact to exacerbate the situation is really unexplored. So to tackle this problem, the Bellin Lab conducted a large-scale forward genetic screen to look for mutants that have neurodegeneration phenotypes. We did this in the classical way by feeding flies with EMS to induce mutations, and we isolated homozygous lethal mutations on the X chromosome. Through a series of crosses, we um, isolated these mutations and created mutant clones in the eye, where we used the visual system as a model for neurodegeneration. So the white cells here are homozygous for uh, the mutation, and the red cells are heterozygous for the mutation. And in this system, we can measure the photoreceptor's ability to respond to light using electroretinograms. So in this assay, we look at, we flash a light, and then we see a depolarization of the photoreceptors. And we isolate the mutants that eventually are unable to respond to light. We isolated 700 mutations, and then we did a secondary screen using transmission electron microscopy. To do this, we, we wanted to look at the subcellular defects that could be present even though uh, there's no physical outward appearance of degeneration just yet. And in fact, this was a very productive screen, as I mentioned, and 93% of the genes that we identified on the X chromosome are conserved to humans. So this is a, just a list to give you a scale of the screen that we conducted, where I have the fly gene on one side and the human homologs on the other. Half of these now are linked to human Mendelian diseases, where the ones in orange were already linked in 2013, and the ones in purple are now, now we know they're linked to a human Mendelian disease. So in a, in a screen of this size, naturally categories arise on genotype or uh, mutations that have similar phenotypes. And this is where I come in, where three different mutants called Sicily, Atzma, and Marf all shared a very unique phenotype which is they accumulated lipid droplets in the glial cells of their um, nervous system prior to neurodegeneration. So these three also have something else in common, and that is that there are nuclear encoded mitochondrial proteins. So most of the mitochondria is actually made up of nuclear encoded mitochondrial proteins that are encoded in the nucleus and then target to the mitochondria for, for function. But in fact, they, fun they work in different regions of the cell and they cause different diseases in humans. So one of them is Sicily, and the human, uh, it's a cytosolic chaperone, and the human mutation causes a recessive infancy neurodegenerative disease called Lee syndrome. And then there is ATSMET, or MARS-2, where it's a mitochondrial tRNA synthetase, which means that it's in the mitochondrial matrix. And a human homolog, when mutated, causes a recessive variable onset disease called spastic ataxia type 3. And then there's MARF, which is an outer membrane fusion protein, and a mutation in the human homolog, mitofusin, causes a dominant adult neurodegenerative disease called charcot marie tooth type 2a. So what I want you to take away from this is that these proteins function in different regions of the cell, they cause different diseases with different dominance, and they all, in the fly, prior to neurodegeneration, accumulate lipid droplets in the glia. So we first isolated and identified this lipid droplet accumulation phenotype through a secondary screen with transmission electron microscopy. So to get everyone on the same page with anatomy here, 
I have uh, one omatidium, so one facet of the fly compound I, where there is pigment glial cells that metabolically and physically support the neurons in the surround in blue. And then I have green photoreceptors in the middle. And these black circles that you see are rhabdomeres. And these are features of photoreceptors that where the photopigment rhodopsin is processed. So you can use these as, uh, I guess, landmarks for neurons. And in a wild type eye, it looks something like this, where the pigment glial cells I've outlined in blue are actually quite thin and they encapsulate the photoreceptor. But in my mutants, they all look something like this. The pigment glial cells are vastly enlarged and there's lipid droplets accumulating inside of these cells. And looking through the literature, it was surprising to us that this was the first documentation where there's an accumulation of lipid droplets in the nervous system. So many questions emerged, but first of all, what are lipid droplets and what are they doing there? Well, lipid droplets are organelles that contain neutral lipids that bud from the ER. And since transmission electron microscopy is quite tedious to do, I switch to another system and use fluorescent microscopy staining with a neutral lipid stain called Nile Red. Normally, you would see the photoreceptor, and there's really not much staining, but you can tell where the rhabdomeres are, which is a great landmark, once again, for neurons. Then in the surround, you have these giant red dots in the mutants, which are the lipid droplets. And in fact, for all three of my mutants, since they all have lipid droplet accumulation, and they all somewhat function in relation to the mitochondria, we wondered whether or not any perturbation of mitochondria function will cause these lipid droplets to accumulate. So on the top here, I have just Sicily, Atma, and Marf with lots of lipid droplets. And then I went on to look at the neuronal specific knockdown of the ND42, which is a mitochondrial complex one protein chaperoned by Sicily. When I knocked ND42 down using rhodopsin, uh, which is expressed only in the photoreceptors, I uh, still find an accumulation of lipid droplets in the glia. So this tells me that lipid droplet accumulation is in fact a cell non-autonomous phenomenon. And then when I looked at the knockdown of Parkin, which is involved in mitochondrial quality control, once again, I found an accumulation of lipid droplets. But this was not the case with pink one mutants or DRP1 mutant clones. And in fact, we found a very strong correlation where mutations that cause a very high level of reactive oxygen species production also have lots of lipid droplets. So we, we presume that high levels of ROS causes lipid droplets to accumulate. So in order to tackle this problem, we thought that suppressing ROS should reduce lipid droplet accumulation. And therefore, I fed flies with the antioxidant that penetrates the blood-brain barrier called N-adenocysteine amide, uh, AD4 for short. And after feeding flies with AD4, there was a reduction in lipid droplet accumulation and also a suppression of neurodegeneration. So we conclude that high levels of ROS causes lipid droplets to accumulate. So I want to take a minute here and talk about how Lipid droplets have not previously been documented in the literature, but I've already shown you several different ways in which I can find lipid droplet accumulation in the nervous system. And so two main things may be happening. One is that in traditional immunohistochemistry, you need to use probably a detergent and sometimes alcohol dehydration to get, uh, get the tissue. And in these cases, you would remove effectively most of the lipids. But another thing that, is, uh, that we found was that this lipid droplet accumulation is in fact transient. They're not always there. In fact, lipid droplet accumulation occurs prior to neurodegeneration, and they slowly disappear with the onset of neurodegeneration. So take Sicily as an example. On day one, there's lots of lipid droplets, and the photoreceptors look pretty good. But then by day three, the, there's less lipid droplets, and the photoreceptors are kind of starting to look a little strangely shaped. And then by day five, the photoreceptors are very disrupted. These eyes cannot respond to light. And the lipid staining becomes very diffuse, as if these lipid droplets have uh, exploded, and now there's just lipids everywhere. Before I go on, I want to introduce my model for glial lipid droplet accumulation, where when there is very high levels of reactive species, uh, oxygen species production, it activates the stress pathway protein c and terminal kinase which then activates the master regulator of lipogenesis, sterile regulatory element binding protein. This leads to lipogenesis that occurs in the neurons. And these lipids are then transferred to glial cells where they accumulate inside of lipid droplets. But at the time, 
All we knew was that when high, there's high levels of reactive oxygen species, it activates junk. But the role of junk in SRBP and lipid droplet accumulation was not previously reported. So to implicate junk and SRBP in this phenomenon, I expressed the cDNA of junk and SRBP in neurons and in glial cells. And neuronal expression of either junk or SRBP is sufficient to cause glial lipid droplet accumulation. So this once again shows that this is a cell non-autonomous effect, and also junk and SRBP are sufficient themselves to induce glial lipid droplet accumulation. So originally, this lipid droplet accumulation phenotype was found in a neurodegeneration stream. So when we, found, when we got this data, it was the question of, well, are lipid droplets themselves causing the neurodegeneration? So to give you a timeline for neurodegeneration in our mutants, after five days, Sicily mutant clones look something like this. This is actin staining, where the circles are where photoreceptors should be, but by five days, they're already pretty much gone. And so I aged the flies expressing junk and SRVP in the neurons. So these have lots of lipid droplet accumulation, but there's no signs of neurodegeneration. So just lipid droplets is not sufficient for, lipid, or, uh, for neurodegeneration to occur. And it's likely that ROS plays a large role in this process. In the context of high ROS and lots of lipids, something happens called lipid peroxidation. And the one that you and I are probably most familiar with on a daily basis would be when oils and meats become rancid. So kind of gross. And on the molecular level, what happens is when oxygen molecules are able to effectively pull hydrogen from any available source, where now the source is lipid, lipid chains. So this vastly disrupts membranes and causes cell death. When I looked at lipid peroxidation, I found that in, in control animals, there's always a low level of peroxidation. But in mutants, such as Sicily, the, there's high levels of lipid peroxidation in anatomically the glial cells, and they're a punctate, so they're inside these lipid droplets. In fact, uh, there's also really exciting corresponding data for, uh, from Alex Gould's lab, where they delve into this deeper, into the um, chemical uh, basis of it, where they found that these lipid droplets actually sequester peroxidated polyunsaturated fatty acids. And this serves as a protective mechanism against oxidative stress. So with, with this data in mind, we, we know that ROS leads to lipid droplet accumulation, and eventually this causes lipid peroxidation. So once again, we've come to our model, where high levels of reactive oxygen species causes lipid droplets to accumulate in glial cells. And we think that this is initially a protective mechanism against oxidative stress. However, with high levels of oxidative stress uh, happening throughout, the lipid peroxidation is overwhelming the ability for the lipid droplets to be protective against neurodegeneration. And so when there's high levels of lipotoxicity and the release of these lipids into glial cells, it triggers a vicious cycle where the disappearance of lipid droplets where they become diffuse is really the trigger and causes very fast neurodegeneration. And when we, when we got to this point, we were wondering, well, could this mechanism be also present in vertebrates? Is this conserved to humans as well? Well, first, we wanted to look at whether or not they could accumulate in mammals. And we looked for a mitochondrial mutant mice, mouse. And we were very lucky, and we found a mouse that had the loss of NDUSF4, which is a mitochondrial complex one stabilizing subunit. The loss of NDUSF4 leads to the, or my, these mice have very high levels of reactive oxygen species. And in fact, they also have severe progressive ataxia. So when the mice are weaned at around day 21, they look OK. And eventually, at day 34, they start becoming a little uncoordinated. And then by day 50, they're unable to move their hind legs, and they die soon after. To demonstrate the evolutionary conservation, I knock down Drosophila and DUSF4 in just neurons and just glial cells. And once again, the neuronal knockdown caused an accumulation of lipid droplets in the glia, so this was very uh, helpful. From here, I worked with my collaborator, Albert Quintana, to look at whether or not these mice have lipid droplet accumulation. And in fact, they do. So this comes back to my uh, first slide, where I found lipid droplets accumulating in the glial cells of these mice at all three stages. So the red cells are astrocytes, and the blue cells are microglia. And lipid droplets, which are yellow, co-localize perfectly with these two glial cell types. 
the liquid droplets are, in fact, there the entire time, where there's the highest amount of liquid droplet accumulation at the mid-stage and the least at the end stage. And this is present throughout the brain at various regions. Specifically, the vestibular nucleus and periaqueductal gray, which are regions that are involved in movement coordination and control. Since these mice look very much or have similar phenotypes to our mutant flies, we wondered whether or not we can suppress their degeneration or delay their degeneration by giving these mice an antioxidant. So working with my collaborator, uh, Albert, we treated these mice by injecting N-acetylcysteine amide, which is the anti antioxidant I used in flies, for a week, and then we tested their ability for motor coordination using the rotor rod assay. So this assay is when you have a progressively accelerating rod, and then you wait for the mouse to fall off. And at day 30, the knockout mice, so that's the blue line, are that are treated with the antioxidant are comparable to wild type. And in fact, if you were blinded and you look at these animals at their end stages at around P50, you'll find that the animals treated with the antioxidant still look significantly better than the animals that weren't, even though they can no longer uh, do the rotor rod assay. So after our work was published, very, very interesting um, study from the Van Simuthas lab showed that if they use the exact same mice and raise them in lower levels of oxygen, so in hypoxia, these mice can live over 160 days. And in fact, if they're raised in hyperoxia, so a lot of oxygen, they die in about half the time as the usual, about 50 days. So this one, once again reinforces the importance of oxidative stress in aging and neurodegeneration. So, so far, I've shown you that high levels of reactive oxygen species leads to glial lipid droplet accumulation that, though initially protective, eventually becomes deleterious and trigger very fast neurodegeneration, and that this mechanism is conserved from flies to mice. And throughout this talk, I've mentioned that neuronal perturbations alone can cause these lipid droplets to accumulate in the glia, but that means lipids should be transferred in some way. But how are lipids transferred? So that was one major question that um, I became interested in near the end of this project, where after reading the literature about how lipids are transferred, most of what, we, what I found was outside of the body. So most of what we know about lipid transfer involves how apolipoproteins, such as ApoE or ApoB, can come together to bind lipids to form lipoproteins. And, the, and this is involved in the transport of fat from the intestines to the liver in the um, context of high-density and low-density lipoproteins. But we don't really know how this is occurring in the nervous system. So that brings me to two major questions. There's lots of lipid droplets, but what is the biosource for making these lipids? And what are the proteins involved in the transfer process itself? And as a fly biologist, I learned that if you're not quite sure which way to go, you should probably do a screen. So for the next thing, I, looked, I did a candidate gene screen to look for proteins involved in lipid production and lipid transport. To make sure this doesn't go out of hand, I had very strict criteria for which candidate genes to look at. These proteins should be expressed in the central nervous system of flies and mammals. It should be involved in metabolism in some way. And there's lots of reagents available so I can do further genetic analysis. And previously, all of my experiments were performed in mutant clones, which will be difficult for a screening process. And also, there is the problem that they're homozygous lethal. So instead, I created a fly that has the rhodopsin promoter constitutively knocking down the mitochondrial complex 1 subunit called ND42. In, this, in these flies, first of all, they're viable. And secondly, they always have lipid droplet accumulation in the glial cells. Then I introduced the neuronal driver LVGAL4 to knock down various proteins and hoped for a loss of lipid droplet accumulation. I then did the same thing using 54CGAL4, which is a pigment glial cell specific GAL4, and once again looked for the loss of lipid droplet accumulation. So this was a pretty extensive screen, and I won't have time to tell you everything that I found. But this is my model for how lipid droplets are produced and transferred from neuron to glia. So in fact, um, these lipids need glial lactate for lipids to be made, where glial lactate is transported through monocarboxylate transporters into neurons. And in neurons, lactate dehydrogenase converts the lactate to pyruvate, 
and pyruvate dehydrogenase converts the pyruvate into acetyl-CoA and brings it into the mitochondria. Normally, it would probably go into the TCA cycle, but since there's constant mitochondrial dysfunction, it's then converted back to citrate and exit the mitochondria and enter the lipid synthesis pathway, where we found a high level of acetyl-CoA carboxylase, which is involved in lipid production. Then, fatty acid transport protein and apolipoproteins work together to activate and transport these lipids from neuron to glial cells, where they form lipid droplets. So there's one area that I want to focus on today, and that is how lipids are transferred. So this involves the apolipoproteins. And going straight into the screen, I was interested in one apolipoprotein that's expressed in the glial cells called glial lacerilla. This is conserved in mice and also in humans, and it's called APOD, apolipoprotein D. And in my screen strategy, I would knock this out in neurons and in glial cells. So knocking it down in neurons would be my negative control since it's not expressed in neurons. And indeed, I still see lipid droplet accumulation after this knockdown. But if I knock down this glial apolipoprotein in glial cells, there's a dramatic reduction of lipid droplet accumulation, suggesting its involvement in this transport process. So since glase is a glial apolipoprotein, I thought of another very famous glial apolipoprotein, which happens to be APOE. And APOE, I would say, is more infamous because it's known as the most prominent Alzheimer's disease risk factor allele, and not too much is known about how, that, how it actually functions in the nervous system. In that uh, Manhattan plot there, the APOE's relationship with Alzheimer's disease has been reinforced across populations and through time. In fact, 40 to 80 percent of diagnosed Alzheimer's disease, disease patients carry at least one copy of APOE4. It's, of course, an apolipoprotein, and it's a component of the low-density lipoprotein. In fact, this protein is polymorphic, so there's three different variants, and they're named E2, E3, and E4. What we know is that every copy of E4 increases an individual's risk at getting Alzheimer's disease. Now, if we look at it a different way, there will be an age of onset for someone who has E3, E3, and then if they have E4, E4, they would get Alzheimer's disease 10 years earlier, whereas the E2 uh, genotype is protective against Alzheimer's disease. Just to make this a little bit more morose, APOE4 is present in about 15% of the population. And even with all this um, epidemiological data at hand, we don't quite know how APOE4 in functions in the brain and how that different differs from the protective allele APOE2. So unfortunately, APOE is not conserved in flies, but its receptor is conserved. So I wondered whether or not we can use the fly to study something about APOE biology. So my goal here is to humanize the fly and wonder if human APOE can functionally replace GLAs in lipid transport. To do this, I utilize the fly that has a mimic insertion into the first coding intron of the GLAs gene. And through recombination mediated cassette exchange, I introduce the Trojan T2A GAL4, where the GLAs T2A GAL4 line is a null mutant for GLAs and can drive the expression of transgenes at the endogenous locus and at the right times. So I would drive the expression of E2, E3, and E4 and determine if that it can replace GLA's function. To do this, I, I once again used my lots of lipid droplet model with the Rhodopsin knockdown of ND42. If I remove GLA's by introducing the T2A GAL4, there's a reduction in lipid droplet accumulation. But if I instead use their GAL4 function and express human APOE2 or human APOE3, there is, once again, a restoration of lipid droplets, suggesting that APOE2 and APOE3 are able to functionally replace GLAs in this lipid transport process. But then, when I looked at the Alzheimer's disease risk factor allele, APOE4, there's not a restoration of lipid droplet accumulation. And this is true across the board. It's not specific to ND42 knockdown. Knockdown of MARF sees the same thing, where APOE2 is a very potent lipid transporter, and APOE4 seems to be a loss of function allele for lipid transport. But to say something is a loss of function, I need to look at the true null phenotype. And since flies don't have APOE, I moved to mice for my next, next experiments, where first I derived neuron and astrocytes from wild-type mice, and plated them, and treated them with a drug called rotenone, which increases levels of oxidative stress. 
after 12 hours, lipid droplets accumulated in the glial cells of these samples. But if I do the same thing with cells derived from APOE null animals, there's very few lipid droplets that accumulate. And so I can definitively say that APOE4 is a loss of function allele for lipid transport. All right, so now I've separated E2 and E3 against E4, where E2 and E3 are good at lipid transport and E4 is not. But what does this do in terms of neurodegeneration? Well, then I took these flies expressing APOE3 and APOE4 and raised them on a very, very low level of rotenone to mimic or to speed up the aging process. And after aging these flies for some time, I found that the E4 expressing flies cannot protect against oxidative stress. They lost significantly more neurons compared to the E3 expressing flies. And in fact, the E4 expressing flies were comparable to flies that were just lacking in GLAs entirely, lacking in an apolipoprotein entirely. So with all this information at hand, we wanted to uh, come up with a proposal on how APOE is related to neurodegeneration and aging. So oxidative stress is prevalent throughout life, and especially it's increased in aging. And with other, other factors, such as traumatic brain injury or stroke, there's even more levels of oxidative stress in the nervous system. For individuals who have the E2 and E3 alleles, they're able to handle the lipid production, transfer them to lipid droplets as a protective mechanism, and this protects the cells from lipotoxicity. But for individuals with E4, they're unable to perform this lipid transfer process. So these lipids are effectively free-floating, and there's high levels of reactive oxygen species leading to lipotoxicity and lipid peroxidation, which eventually is deleterious to the nervous system function. So at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that usually in any neurodegenerative disease, there are many hallmarks and there's many things going on at the same time and it's difficult to parse the synergism. But now that I know something about how reactive oxygen species and lipid metabolism are affected in neurodegenerative disease, I have a foundation in which to build further hypotheses and bring in other aspects of diseases such as Alzheimer's. So I want to put out there that another hallmark of neurodegenerative, uh, neurodegenerative disease, especially Alzheimer's disease, is the formation of A-beta-42, which is a protein fragment, oligomers and plaques in the extracellular space of eight Alzheimer's brains. Where normally, in a non-AD brain, this will be degraded inside of glial cells. But what we also know is that A-beta-42 binds to lipidated APOE3, but they're unable to bind to APOE4. So the question would be that is there a synergism between the inability for APOE4 to transport lipids and the accumulation and oligomerization of A-beta-42, and these insults altogether eventually tip the scale and causes neurodegeneration. So now I'm at the end of my talk, and I would like to thank all the people who were able to uh, get me to where I am today. So first and foremost, I want to thank my mentor, Hugo, who has provided endless intellectual support and academic freedom to try all the experiments and to find a direction for this project. And I also want to thank Ka Zhang, who was a previous graduate student in the lab, and he really helped me start out with this lipid droplet story. And Hector, Shania, Manish, and Bafa, and Karen are ones who were brave enough to do such a large-scale screen, and they have given me so many good suggestions and everything else. And my collaborators, um, Albert, Mariana, and Kevin, have helped me develop into somewhat, almost, of a mouse biologist. And um, they have been extremely supportive in their efforts as well. And finally, and most importantly, I would say, is that these experiments would have taken three times as long, if not for the generosity of the Trisophila community, and for really having a whole community embody the sharing is caring and um, having all these reagents available and everyone's being so open with their, uh, with their minds and also with what they have created. And finally, our funding sources for understanding the importance of basic biology. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. If anybody has questions for Lucy. Uh, use the microphone, please. Yeah. How do you get out of this? Oh, you got to reset.